Fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy night. I'm going to get that gun of mine, and I'm going to change you from a rooster to a hen with one shot. Some people call me a freak. I hate that word. I don't believe in it. Better yet, I don't believe in labels. You know, I think you're the only girl in the world that can stand on a stage with a spotlight in her eye and still see a diamond inside a man's pocket. Because I'm up at five every morning working my ass off. Does someone want to just tell me to my face you're never going to give me the scores I deserve? Welcome to Girls on Film. I'm Anna Smith. I'm coming to you from Cameo Studios in Mayfair. And this episode is an industry special. I am joined by three very wonderful women who are working in the world of film. And we're going to have a bit of chat about their careers and then talk about some of their favourite films. Our first guest is Hilary Oliver. She is the CEO of Cameo Productions Limited. She's also a freelance broadcaster and writer. Welcome, Hilary. Hello, Anna. It's great to be here in my own studio talking to you. Well, thank you for having <laughs> us. It's always an honour. Now, our next guest is Holly F. Tarquini. She is executive director of Film Bath and F Rating founder. Welcome, Holly. Thank you very much. I'm glad you included the F in my name as well. Yes, I like to. I think it seems very appropriate. What does it stand for? Francesca. Very nice. Now, our final guest is Chiara Marañón, and she's Director of Programming at MUBI. Welcome, Chiara. Thank you very much for having me. I'm very glad to be here. Well, we're big fans of MUBI, as you know, so thank you so much for joining us. Let's start by talking a little bit more about what you all do. Now, Hilary, tell us more about Cameo and how you, how you came here. Well, it all started quite a number of years ago. I worked in local radio and I used to promote film very heavily on the local station. And I saw these little packages that came through with a few desultory clips from movies. And I thought I could do a better package than that. So I essentially created the package to send to radio stations that I would like to have received as a producer and presenter. Good film clips, good interviews with the stars, the directors, the composers, the writers, you name it. And then I went and sold that idea into the major distributor and the smaller distributors here who at that time Anna really didn't put any money or very much faith into radio promotion it has changed now I can tell you in 30 years <laughs> I'm very very glad to say there's always a budget for radio and not only that the stars love doing it I mean Tom Hanks time after time we go out and do interviews with him and his enthusiasm comes through but he's a huge fan of, of radio and Danny Boyle for example once famously said, and this would be on my tomb, that his campaigns wouldn't be the same without Cameo. So those are, you know, that's lovely feedback to, to get oh, for, for, for an idea that uh, that was a germ all those years ago. Congratulations, you've yeah. made a ma massive success of it. And I also just like to say that Julie Andrews has been here too, which I just discovered. She certainly has. I'm just excited about <laughs> sitting in the room that Julie Andrews <laughs> has sat in. Fantastic. Congratulations. We'll find out a little bit more about that shortly. But Holly, um, the F rating is a wonderful test and it's going swimmingly. A lot of people have adopted it. Tell us more about it. So I came up with the F rating in 2014 at the Film Bath Festival and it was sparked by an idea. So Elaine Teja in Sweden, she ran three cinemas and she decided that every film that passed the Bechdel test would get an A rating. And actually at the time I didn't know it was an A rating, I just knew that she was highlighting them. And Elspeth, who's on our programming team, said, brilliant, why don't we do that with our festival programme? We'll just highlight all the films that passed the Bechdel test. And I loved it as an idea, but as we all know, the Bechdel test isn't a test. It's a cartoon. It's a joke. It's a brilliant way of kind of watching films and thinking, is this about anything other than the male protagonist? But it's not a test. And what I was really interested in is who tells the stories, because obviously the person that tells the stories brings their life experience to those stories. So the F rating is applied to every film which is directed and or written by a woman. If the film is directed and written by women, and stars significant women in their own right, then it, has, it gets a triple F rating, which is our kind of gold standard. And so it began life just for the Bath Film Festival, but then got so much media coverage and attention that I invited all of the film festivals and the cinemas in the country to F rate their programmes. So there are now over 80 other organisations who use the F rating so that people can see it in the programme, they can see it on the website and 
proactively choose to go and see films directed and or written by women. So it's now used as a kind of like a fair trade stamp so that we as consumers of film can kind of vote with our feet. And it's also on IMDb, so you can search IMDb for F-rated and there's over 24,000 titles that come up. So, yeah, it's gained a huge amount of traction. Did you ever imagine it would get this big when no. you started it? It was designed just solely for a regional film festival to highlight those films to our audiences. But now when I go to film festivals and they don't use it, I have to spend hours reading the programme and working out whether that's a woman. <laughs> <laughs> and think, I often do the Google for the picture yes. and all that stuff, yeah. Yeah, and often because on IMDb there's no picture and the name, you don't necessarily know whether it's a male name or a female name. And then, yeah, you have to do an image search to find out. Well, I think there are probably quite a lot of F-rated films on Mubi. So, Kiara, would you like to tell us more about being Director of Programming on the streaming service? Yes, so um, briefly for the unacquainted, uh, Mubi is an online global cinema with a special focus on classic cinema and foreign cinema and international and independent. I mean, I'm the head of programming in the UK and I'm part of a, of a larger team of programmers because we serve the entire world. And what it's the main characteristic of Movies Proposal is that we are focused on quality instead of quantity. So as opposed to other streaming services, we just offer a very small selection of films, um, highly curated, so there's only 30 films available at any given time and every midnight one joins the program and one disappears, so they are constantly rotating. So the idea of movie is fighting that uh, phenomenon of the paradox of choice by which people spend more time deciding what to watch uh, rather than actually watching and, and, and this idea of just scrolling down for 40 minutes before just going to bed frustrated. So you're going to find less, but all of them are going to be worth a watch. Apart from that, we've ventured into the theatrical landscape. So um, we are also theatrical distributors and we've been able to bring to UK audiences in the cinema a lot of films that uh, wouldn't have had the opportunity to be seen on the big screen. And uh, more recently, and another project I'm involved in is Movie Go. I don't know if you want to tell a little bit Please about do, it. Please do, because it means free cinema tickets. That's a great thing. <laughs> yes, we love that's that. that's always a great thing. <laughs> so basically, the idea is to transfer our curatorial voice uh, from the digital landscape to the to the theatrical environment. And every Friday, uh, we pick a film that it's out on release, and all our subscribers can go watch it for free at any of our movie cinema partners, which at the moment are 150 across the UK. So um, this is a scheme designed to encourage cinema attendance and we work very closely with exhibitors and with distributors to bring visibility to these films and um, bring new audiences to the cinema, basically erasing those two barriers that are mainly cost and uh, choice again. But cost, as we know, uh, young people are mostly not able to afford the, the, the London prices for cinema tickets. So we are just like letting them know that it's on us. And you've had things like Booksmart and Borders. Yes. They, they tend to be like, can you describe what kind of films you might generally pick? Well, it really depends on what's out on release because that's, I mean, that's one of the rules we've so far been respecting that it's only films on release because we want to be helpful to the film in its opening week as well. But we try to apply the same criteria that we apply on the platform. Obviously, we want a diversity of voices and, and countries of origin and, and genres and different types of um, of approaches to cinema. And that has been mainly guiding our choices so far. Just good films. You know what I mean? <laughs> that's <laughs> that's it. it. You, you, honestly, I, I can't fault your creation because even you know I'm a critic and I don't always agree with everyone. But literally, every, <laughs> everything on your site, I'm like, oh, that's a really good film. Genuinely, is the case. Amazing. Thank you. Now, all of you work for companies that employ a lot of women, which is fantastic and Hilary you employ a lot of women I Let, do <laughs> let's talk a little bit about Cameo and how you've always felt strongly I presume that it's great to work with other women it is and when I first started off I had entirely male staff I have to say because in the main coming through then it was young men who were coming out with degrees and diplomas in the technical side of what we need to do and journalists as well because my career covers you know radio 
print the lot, um, sort of an all-rounder, if you like. And coming through um, the radio at that time, it was mostly young men who were applying for jobs, mostly young men who had the qualifications, the experience and so on. But bit by bit over the years, more and more females have come forward. They're doing their training. They're going into radio. They're loving radio. And again, we get the the good all-rounders, people who've got good journalistic skills, a very high production skills as well. And coincidentally, and it is purely coincidentally, we have 10 people in total, including a couple of directors, eight of whom are women. We have hired men. We've had great men. We had a male MD at one point. But uh, it's just happened and, and I'm delighted to see it. Yeah, I must say it's a very very female-friendly, welcoming environment here and everyone's, yeah, top of their game. Thank you, yeah. thank you. And I think everybody feels that when they come in. A couple of the old crusties are a bit funny and they look through the glass and they go, oh, a woman engineer? Uh, but that's a generational thing, I'd like to say. And I'm, <laughs> you know, I'm not going to be too down and I'm not going to name names about that. But in the main, people really love coming in and it's such a change. It's refreshing, yeah. Well, and hopefully these old crusties, as you call them, are learning something and they're being educated. I sincerely hope so. It's never too late. They're tackling their (laughs) unconscious bias, which is what we're all about here. That's really good. Holly, now, Film Bath and the F-Rating, I presume you work with quite a lot of other women. Tell us about the setup. So Film Bath is a charity and for nine months of the year, it's just me. So that's all women. Uh, (laughs) All women. All one woman. (laughs) 100%. And then... For three months, we bring in about four or five people to help with the festival and about 70 volunteers. They're all massively varied. We have a board of trustees because we're a charity and there are eight of them chaired by a woman, four of them are women, four of them are men. Our programming team, again, is eight people, four men, four women. So actually, it's more balanced than entirely women, but most of the ones that come and do work experience are female But that worries me as well because it worries me that the men are getting paid experience and the women are coming and not valuing themselves as much and doing work experience with me when they're brilliant. And they do leave and get fantastic jobs. So you're saying you'll get more applications from women for work experience? Far more. That's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Something to think about. Um, Kiara, let's talk a little bit about Mubi because there are a lot of wonderful women that I've met in passing um, who work at Mubi. And also you do have a lot of films directed by women as well, don't you? Yeah, so in terms of the team, I think doing back of napkin calculations, I think we are like pretty balanced and we have, like for example in the content team, I think we have a majority of women and as well as in the marketing team, perhaps in the engineering team is not the case, but I think overall we have a good 50-50, if not more women, which is um, great. I have to say I've been there for eight years and when I joined it was a six people team, so it's been amazing to see how how it has been um, growing in this direction and also to your point of the new generations because Mubi is a very young company and um, a lot of young people working at Mubi I have to say it's very exciting to see how the new generations are like really aware of like what's going on and and, and they bring a lot of very informed and, and refreshing perspectives to the work and I think that's that's what has made possible to transfer all that ethos into into what we do and, and, and what we give visibility to in terms of the films we champion and the filmmakers we feature. So, yes, it's been part of our um, editorial line to, to support amazing work uh, by women. And also, not only women filmmakers, but also um, interesting, like, female-led stories and um narratives. So we're all behind women in the industry. Holly, let's start with you. How do we support women working in the industry and support female-led films? So I think it's really simple. As audiences, we choose films directed by, written by, starring women, ideally with cinematographers that are women, and we pay to go and see them at the cinema. If it's possible, if you've got the money, search them out and go and see them. And the thing I would say is that because it is harder for women to direct, especially a feature film, that by the time they've done that, there are, let's say, 85, 90% of feature films directed by women are brilliant, as opposed to maybe 20, 30% by men, just because of the sheer weight of traffic. And so you're very likely to go and see a really good film. So I think that's the number one, go and see it in the cinema, opening weekend if you can at all afford it if you can't then watch it when you when you yeah watch it on movie stream it 
Um, and everybody can encourage their cinemas and their film festivals, movie, their magazines to F rate their programs so that it's easy to find the films that are the stories told by women. And if people want to F rate their films, they can get in touch with you how? So anybody can email me, hello at filmbath.org.uk. They can F rate their program. It doesn't cost them anything. I send instructions. Sometimes I send stickers and temporary tattoos. And also, interestingly, for um, exhibitors and distributors, there's an endless press interest in the F rating. So every time the Irish Film Institute adopted it recently and rain dance adopted it last year and the press treat it as though it's a brand new thing every time so it's brilliant for coverage hopefully they do a big story about this episode that would be good wouldn't it yes. yeah let's do that yeah and um, so chiara <laughs> how, how do people support women in film um i was just thinking that um in order to also have more women making films that we can go and see we also need more women at other capacities in the film industry and we need more women directing festivals and programming festivals and um, in juries and in funding bodies and all sorts of um, structures that are, are going to allow for films to get made and get seen. So um, that's crucial too. So I would just add to that that I wouldn't just have women. So my new thing is appointing feminists. So what I think is really important because often what seems to happen is the Theresa Mays and the Margaret Thatchers. So the women that have the same values as the men are promoted to the top and then they keep all of those structural uh, sexism, racism, ageism, <laughs> ableism in place and that's why they're promoted. So being female isn't really enough, I would say. I'd say what you have to do is you support and you promote the feminists because they're the ones that will make the difference. I mean, Hilary, you sort of mentioned that mm. things have changed in your time um, since you've sort of working in, in broadcasting in particular. Yeah. It's hard to sort of sum it up. But in, in the last five years, it feels like things have escalated. Mm. From your perspective, are things different in terms of the gender balance? There's attitude change generally, um, I, I would say. I mean, when I started off, first of all, I was running this company, doing freelance work for journalism and for the radio, as you, as you mentioned before. And you didn't dare say back then that you were a mother, that children were ever around. And I remember one woman from a fairly big distributor saying to me, oh, are you just too selfish ever to have had children? And she nearly dropped on the spot when I told her I had three kids. And she said, but how do you manage to, how do you do this sort of thing? How do you do this stuff? You make it happen. That's how you do it, you know. And, and if it's your own business, you put that much more energy into it, I suppose. So from, from that point of view, I think that that change is good. You can now talk about it. Employers have to be more aware of women with their children. We have a pregnant member of staff at the moment. It's going to be our first cameo baby. I'm yeah, delighted to say. Yes. So that has definitely changed. The discrimination really was on technical things, like going to buy something technical when a man sold the whole idea to my male colleague standing beside me and then saw that I was going to write the cheque for it and nearly dropped on, on the spot as well. So, you know, you, that, that sort of thing wouldn't happen. And I put him in his place. I just said, you know, really, you mustn't make assumptions about people. I am the boss here. Did you get it. a little bit of a kick out of it when you saw his face oh, when he wrote the cheque? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Why not? <laughs> Quite right, too. Again, yeah. tackling that vice and yes. just showing people, yeah. okay, who's the boss? Mm. Well done. I mean, Holly, you started the F rating before the whole Time's Up thing kicked off have you noticed a massive escalation in the response to this yeah and it's interesting that there's so much more feminism sort of sprinkled around everything isn't there so in every mainstream film now it there are at the very least hints to it if not overt feminism within them which is really fantastic but I do worry that it's all surface I hear a lot of stories about in Hollywood it's kind of all the white men hunkering down going don't worry it'll pass we've been here before it passed we just need like the Spice Girls to take all their clothes off and tell, say that it's girl power and we'll all be fine again you know they're still pole dancing for, for fun we're okay um, so yes I think that there is a massive groundswell and I think you know Trump Boris there is a huge backlash and I think that that threat to the mediocre man is great and we shouldn't underestimate it.
That is very well put. Sobering, but well put. <laughs> Absolutely. No, I, I, I completely agree with you. Chiara, you were nodding there. What, what's your feeling on that? No, I was just I, I was just agreeing with what you were saying, but also just um, it, it comes to a point when, when you see what Hollywood is doing with um, all these remakes and revamping franchises from a, from a female perspective, or, or as you were saying, like how feminism seems to be sprinkled around things, but seems to be mostly superficial. Mm. It almost, yeah, it comes to a point in which it becomes formulaic and and also like a like a business in itself, you mm. know, it just doesn't really transpire as a um, as a real change of of mentality. It has to start somewhere, but we need to be aware of that and just not take it as as progress in itself. It's just, I guess. Uh, um, still in the works. <laughs> so I was very optimistic that I am an optimist and I thought all we have to do is change the stories that we see on screen to reflect a different kind of a world, a more equal world. And as long as we've got, you know, black female surgeons on screen being black female surgeons, but there's no issue about them either being female or being black. They're just exactly. there doing it in the background. 50% mm -hmm. of all crowd scenes are female. You know, all of those things. We just change all of that on screen and we will change. Culture will change. But actually, I think there's so much systemic change that we need. Like when you were talking about parenting, we don't make fathers take time off. And whilst we don't make them and they have to be made, then you still have that whole small businesses not employing young women because they might get pregnant. And, you know, that's a, a, a huge financial choice that they're having to make and it's understandable but if you said okay men have kids too and they need to take care of them and you changed it culturally then everything else changes and maybe changing the movies maybe not enough it's a start but yes, I, yes if I, I mean do you think that we're hopefully now a new generation coming up watching you know captain marvel for example you know positive depictions of women on mainstream cinema they will start making better decisions in the workplace or more positive ones in favour of equality. But I also, I, well, I'm sorry, I, I am an optimist, but I've been a bit down lately. So I've got two daughters and they are fierce, terrifying feminists. Never bring up a feminist daughter. <laughs> they will fight you every step of the way. Uh, and my fear for them is that they know all of the terrible statistics. So whereas I feel as I grew up in a golden moment where we thought that we'd done it and we had equality and that we could do anything, and so we did, whereas now everybody knows that 95% of the top 100 movies are directed by white men. And so there's a perception that it's not a woman's thing to do. And that combined with Instagram, porn, imagery of women and what you're supposed to look like and actually liberation is all about looks for women still and not about actions, despite Captain Marvel. You know, she still is stunningly beautiful and slim and blonde and that I'm not sure. I'm sorry. She, she didn't wear a really tight top, though. We did. <laughs> it's a small, <laughs> small amounts of progress. She once wore at a very time. tight outfit. Well, yes, there, there was the whole cat suit thing. Yeah, I'll, I'll grant you that. Um, I mean, it's ridiculous because I remember when myself and Larishka did a Captain Marvel special and we were just going on for ages about how great it was that she just wore a baggy T-shirt. It's like, it's ridiculous. That should just be the norm. But the fact that this was so wonderfully refreshing. But, yeah. yeah, baby steps, isn't it? <laughs> I'm slightly more of an optimist. But then maybe I'm in a little bit of a bubble about that and, and you're kind of seeing the wider picture but but you say you you know you're raising feminist daughters I think I raised I hope I raised three feminist sons <laughs> which I think is even more important yeah yeah I think so bravo <laughs> bravo to you all for the great work you do thank you very much for telling me about your careers so I've asked you all to prepare a short list of films that are important to you, films that made an impression on you. They don't necessarily have to be female focused, but they may well be. I'll start with you, Chiara. What is your first choice? Uh, my first choice is uh, Jan Dielman by Chantal Ackerman. This is the first film I ever saw um, by Chantal Ackerman. And it's important to me because she really became one of my favorite directors, actually immediately <laughs> after seeing this film. It has a, a daunting runtime of three hours, and it almost all takes place in one location, which is this flat in Brussels. And we only see almost one character, which is John Yelman. So it could even be defined as a, as a character study. And basically what we observe for these three hours is her routine, 
and how she carries out um, a lot of different tasks in the house. So we see her making the bed, preparing lunch, washing the dishes, um, having dinner, taking a bath. So it's all these everyday actions that are seen in so much detail that uh, felt so revolutionary because these are the bits that normally would be cut out of films and, and, and this film is all about them and also the other thing that was so um, kind of mind blowing about it is how it was able to, to become suspenseful as well and how by observing Lee's little actions she was able to create attention from the repetition and, and she managed to do this at a very early age I think she was like 23 or 24 or like super young um, which is very impressive and 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 makes this f for me a, a visionary work. And it's often the sign of a great filmmaker, isn't it? They can make the smallest detail interesting and just you know literally nothing's happening, but it's of great import and it's just fascinating. Exactly. What's your second choice? The second choice is um, Johnny Guitar by Nicholas Ray, and um, this is a film from 1954. It's definitely, I don't know, I, th I think it's also billed as one of the first feminist westerns. Um, it's definitely the, the first feminist western I saw. It's funny because um, we call it a feminist film, but probably it wouldn't even pass the, the, the Bechdel test because what makes it feminist is the characterization of, of the protagonists and, and, and how John Crawford has like very manly attributes and that makes her very interesting and complex and, and rich as a, as a character but uh, really um, all that is going on there is like loving a man. This story of a woman who lived and loved too hard and wanted too much, willing to fight any odds to get it. Down there I sell whiskey and cards. All you can buy up these stairs is a bullet in the head. Now which do you want? Starring Joan Crawford, the screen's most dynamic artist. Sterling Hayden as Johnny Guitar. Um, I think technically it's impeccable. It just feels that you are you are inside of a dream or or, or, or a nightmare. So in terms of, of the codes of Western is also like very distinctive and plays with, with time and space in, in, in very interesting ways. So I think it altogether just made it uh, unforgettable for me and just one of the all-time favourites. I'll put these all in the show notes um, on the blurb and whatever platform you're, you're listening to this on because I think people will want to seek all these out. Thank you very much, Chiara. Hilary, have you got something a bit Spanish flavoured for me? I do indeed. And yeah. actually, it, it sort of feeds into uh, the first choice that Kiara made. It's called La Camarista, the, the chambermaid. And I spotted it at the LFF last year. And I really, really liked it. And it's um, written and directed by Lila Aviles and a guy called Juan Carlos Marquez. It actually started life as a, as a play. She's an actor and a director of opera. And she's not a filmmaker. And so she showed this little play, The Chambermaid, to some chambermaids who loved it. And from that developed the, the whole idea of making it into a movie. It features this one poor lassie called Eva. She is a single mother. She's working in a very kind of high-end hotel in Mexico City. And there are several things keeping her going in her life. One thing is her little son, Ruben, whom she just does not get to see. The hotel is hermetically sealed. We never see her leave it. There's notably no music in this film at all. So you just get these views of Mexico City and the work of this woman. And I think the parallels will be drawn, obviously, with with Alfonso Cuaron's Roma. Um, it's not all doom and gloom. I have to say that. That might I've made, might have made it sound a little bit miserable, but it's not. There's a lovely running gag with the window cleaner who happens to be cleaning the windows outside the rooms that she's cleaning. And he puts up these suds and then he kind of draws hearts in the window and she just closes the blind really slowly on him <laughs> until one day she gives him a bit of an eyeful and he's, and he's not <laughs> expecting it. So there's this, this lovely humour going on in, in it as well. I must say, I really, really warm to this film. Try and catch this. Because that's out pretty soon in the it UK, is, isn't it? It's, it's out at the end of July, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and I'm delighted it's getting a release here. As I say, I told you before, I think I often search these, these out at the LFA because there's no guarantee that they will get a release or a wide release. Uh, but I think this one, yeah will be accessible. I'm totally sold on that one. I want to see La Camarista. Mm. And your second choice? Well, my second choice, I've got a really, really, really fond spot in my heart for Grace of My Heart, written and directed by Alison Anders. It came out in 1996, produced by Martin Scorsese, who's 
then girlfriend, Leanna Douglas, she was the, she's the lead in it. And it's based, loosely based on the life of the wonderful singer songwriter, Carol King. But the lovely, lovely thing about this movie is the songs are all original. But when you listen to them, you think, oh, I think I know that. I think I know that song, but you don't know it because they've all been written But the pastiche. They're so well done. And of course, the big, big song from that movie was God Give Me Strength. And it was written by Elvis Costello and Burt Bacharach. And they wrote it across the Atlantic. Apparently, they never really met. That was the story I heard at the time. So God give me strength. God. Know the first thing about how to save even myself with a song, much less the world. You're the best songwriter in this joke of a business. I think we should try to make it, uh, make it big. You were holding out on me. Why did you save your best song for girls? I'm a singer, and I'm going to record my own stuff. And one of the lovely things about it is there are references made, I think, to, to people that you you will know the song by Leslie Gore, It's My Party. There's a character in this, and although she's singing these very twee American songs about the boy next door type of thing, she's actually in love with the girl next door. And that was based on Leslie Gore, who was gay and who didn't really come out. So they've, they've incorporated so many of those ideas into it without offending anybody. Um, yeah, she, I think she, this gets a, a triple F, Holly. <laughs> Excellent. Grace of my heart, triple F. Yeah. And a thumbs up from Harry too. Brilliant. Holly. Um, are they, have the films you picked, are they F-rated? Does it matter? They are all F-rated uh, and unashamedly lowbrow. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Let's have a bit of a contrast. So I've picked uh, three films. I always find it really difficult. So people often say to me, what's your favourite film? And I go into complete kind of, I'm not a boy. I don't have ten list of ten favourite films. I have different films that were favourites at different times. And you asked for influential so these chart my kind of feminist journey. So the first one is Point Break, which I think is 91. And it was, of course, directed by Catherine Bigelow, who's the only woman who won an Oscar for Best Director. And at the time she was, I think she was the fifth woman ever to be nominated for it. And so I was 20 in 91 and I loved Point Break. So uh, it's a uh, high octane. I'm sure you've all seen it. It's Keanu Reeves. It's um, Many times, Patrick yes. Swayze. It's got a lot of action, a lot of surfing. Keanu Reeves learned to surf on it and then took up surfing. And what is interesting is that at that time, I, like I think most feminists in the 90s, thought the work was done, we had equality, and we can all look at the world through the male gaze. The male gaze is everything, and now we have it as well. And this is not to criticise Catherine Bigelow, because I think she should make whatever film she wants. And if she wants to make them with a the male gaze and with loads of action in, a, in what is perceived to be a masculine way, I think good on her. She makes great films and that's fine. So it's not a criticism of her, but it's really a criticism of my younger self, who was a misogynist, really. I thought because the work had been done, the women who weren't brilliant and successful were rubbish and stupid, not like me, that was brilliant, without for a second recognising my privilege, where I'd come from, my connections, how I got to do what I did at the time. So that's my first one. My second one is In a World, which oh, I think it was 2010, maybe, which is directed, written and stars Lake Bell and is a screwball comedy, and I, I love it. We should try it, actually. So it's called In a World. Do you know it? I, I love this film. I love great it. choice. Yeah, great. great choice. So it's yeah. called In a World because her father is uh, the sort of second in line to being the voiceover for trailers, where they go, In, in a World. world. <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty good. <laughs> and Lake Bell wrote it because women aren't asked to do those trailers because, obviously, women can't sell a film because we're shrill and who wants to listen to us? Ready, ready. This Wednesday, one woman will teach another woman. <clears throat> I just woke up, so my voice is cold. Let's face it, the industry does not crave a female yeah, sound. Yeah, Dad, you made me painfully aware of that my whole but life. Not I being don't sexist, like... that's just the truth. You should stick with the accents. That's what you're good at. What was that great, that Russian Star Wars thing you used to do as a yeah, kid? Yeah, I know the one you're talking about. Please, let me hear it. <laughs> These are not the droids you're looking for. <laughs> I just love that. It's so random. Lake Bell's got a magnificent voice. She can do every accent. And it also has Gina Davis in it as an exec who comes along and chooses Lake Bell. 
Uh, and Gina Davis had only recently set up the Gina Davis Research Institute, which she set up because she had a daughter and saw that her daughter wasn't on screen. And so she had a whole movement called See Jane because what she wanted was role models on screen for her daughter and where were all those roles. And she's done, the institution has done lots and lots of research about representation on screen and behind the camera. And one of the interesting things that they found was that I think by the age of four, Girls have been taught to see the world through boys' eyes and boys have been taught that it is bad to see the world through girls' eyes. And so you can have male protagonists and everybody will watch it, but if you have female protagonists, it's only for girls, which is obviously bad for everybody. So interestingly, In a World is triple F rated because it's written, directed and stars women. But I think it is still kind of bitching about other girls because there's quite a lot of judgment about baby voice so late bell what she does is listen to voices and when she hears i can't do the voice at all can you do a, a baby voice i probably can't, I can't actually remember that one though sorry so she does a kind of sexy <laughs> baby, voice. baby voice like that yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes exactly which is kind of doing the whole oh, i'm stupid because stupid is sexy and i'm not challenging but there is still that kind of judgment of the us and them women so I think that was a kind of midpoint in my feminism when I was still thinking yes and you're all idiots so I still had a kind of not enough of a sisterly attitude my third choice is Booksmart which came out recently directed by Oliver Wilde and I love 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 Booksmart so there are so many things that I love about the film but one of the main things that I love about it is that it is not judgmental so I watched the whole film kind of on the edge of my seat going oh and when are they going to be shamed for being who they are and when are they going to shame all of their high school contemporaries because we all know that American high school is basically just shaming everybody whoever you you know if you're a jock then you're shamed because you're stupid and if you're one of the beautiful women then you're shamed because you're beautiful and, and it doesn't happen and in fact my favorite character I think everybody's favorite character is Gigi played by Billy Lord who pops up every so often and apparently they would keep her on set when they were filming just so that she could pop in and do stuff so Oliver would go do you need to go now can you just can you just stay at the back and then when they finish him and go have we got another half hour should we just do another bit with Gigi because she was so brilliant and she is white privilege bonkers that takes too many drugs and rocks up at the kind of most inopportune moments but actually is incredibly lovable and so I think that character is usually a bit stupid and a bit kind of vilified and she's not she's the character that you most love that everybody has in their lives and you can remember when you were at, when I was at university I know exactly Zara was my Gigi and everybody's got a Gigi that they had in their lives and the Barbie, so there's a scene oh, the where they do, scene. oh, so good. It's so a whole drug scene where they've got stop motion Barbies. And again, you could so easily have had that as just kind of Barbie shaming because Barbies and the whole kind of disproportionate and they are bad. And But it's not, it's half shaming and then half going, oh, I'm a Barbie, I'm really sexy. <laughs> and it's also, yeah, very triple rate, F rated. I love that you've highlighted the fact that the characters are quite contradictory, which I think is one of the loveliest things about it. A lot of character elements that are in real people, but very rarely seen in cinema. And um, we spoke about it on our book spot special episode where we had interviews with the main cast, if people want to listen to it. Because I think basically, Girls and Film, we could talk about Booksmart all day. I think everyone here <laughs> knows and loves that film, right? Brilliant choice. So Booksmart brought you to your current feminist state. Well, of course, <laughs> apart from Booksmart is... So it's been criticised quite a lot for being white feminism, which I always get a bit upset about because it's only the women that are criticised for not being intersectional. So nobody picks up the men's films and goes, actually, I don't think you've got enough black characters in that. Oh, not nobody does, but mm -hmm. it is less critical. Whereas if a woman makes a film, it has to be all things to all people at all times. And actually, I think Booksmart crosses more things than than it has been criticised for. Definitely. I totally agree. Um, thank you all for your choices, ladies. They were absolutely fascinating. I will put them all in the reading matter for the listeners to uh, catch up with because I think there's a lot of exciting stuff there. It's been such a pleasure to have all three of you on and I feel inspired and invigorated. <laughs> thank you, Hilary. Thanks, Anna. I enjoyed have, it. Have you enjoyed it? Good. Yeah. Kiara, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. And thank you, Holly. Thank it's you. been a great pleasure. Um, thanks to all the listeners and thank you to our executive producer, Heather Archbold, 
Gold and our audio producer Jane Long from HLA. Thank you to Cameo for hosting us and thank you all for listening and being Girls on Film. Thanks for listening to Girls on Film and thanks also to our partner Mubi for offering listeners an amazing deal of a free month's subscription. They have movies like Border and The Duke of Burgundy on the streaming service at the moment and you also get a free cinema ticket on the week of release with Mubi Go. If you'd like a month of free streaming plus four free hand-picked UK cinema tickets, sign up at mubi.com slash girlsonfilm. How many men have you forgotten? As many women as you remember. <laughs> 